Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters in Christ. Once again, a very warm welcome to you all. I'm Dr. Janice Sang, your MC and moderator for tonight. This time, a week ago, it was exactly 170 years since the very first Divine Sunday service was being conducted at St. John's Cathedral on the 11th of March, 1849. In celebration of the cathedral's 170th anniversary, we are very honored to have the extra presence and blessing of the Right Reverend Professor Angie Wright, one of the world's famous leading Bible scholars, to speak to us at this week's St. John's Public Lecture. Firstly, tonight, then second Wednesday evening, the 20th, at this cathedral, as well as the third and finale of the series on Thursday, the 21st, at 7.30 p.m. at the Grand Hall of the University of Hong Kong. Tonight's topic is the Bible's challenge to today's world. How does the Bible speak truth to power and money today? At the end of the address by Bishop Wright, there will be a Q&A session. There will be a retiring collection at the end of the Q&A and closing prayer. Please support his ministry through this public lecture series. Refreshments will also be served at the Lee Hall next door. Please do join us for further fellowship. And may we now begin by singing the St. John's Cathedral 170th anniversary hymn. Please stand. to do the opening prayer for us, followed by the introduction of our most honourable guest speaker of this evening. Dean Mathias, please. 
Let us pray. Almighty and gracious God, we give you thanks for your love upon us and for calling us to come close to you. And through the life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, you have shown us the way, the truth, and the life. As we gather for this lecture, may your Holy Spirit open our ears, our minds, and our hearts. You know our needs, and you know the circumstances that we are facing. Grant your Spirit that through the lectures of Bishop Tom Wright, that our hearts will be warmed and our souls will be lifted up towards you, and that we may be empowered to become instruments of your grace in today's world. And we pray this in the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. It is indeed my great joy and our great honor to welcome you to St. John's Cathedral as part of our 170th anniversary celebration. And it is with great joy that we welcome Professor Nicholas Tom Wright, currently the Chair of New Testament and Early Christianity at the School of Divinity at the University of St. Andrew, Scotland, in Almist. Professor Wright served as the Dean of Litchfield Cathedral from 1994 to 99, as a canon theologian at Westminster Abbey from 2000 to 2003, and then the Bishop of Durham from 2003 to 2010. And before that, for more than 20 years, he taught New Testament studies at Cambridge, McGill, and Oxford Universities. Bishop Wright has authored 82 books, including award-winning titles, The Day of the Revolution Began, Simply Jesus, Surprised by Hope, and Simply Christians. So it is our great honor and our delight to welcome him to St. John's as our keynote speaker for the lectures as part of our 170th anniversary celebration. So without further ado, let's put our hands together to welcome Professor Wright. Thank you so much for your invitation and your welcome. It's exciting for me to be back in Hong Kong after many years and to join you in celebrating the 170th anniversary of this great cathedral. It was delightful to be here and to be able to preach yesterday, and it's great to see you all here tonight. I congratulate you on this anniversary, and I pray that God will continue to bless the worship and witness of this house of prayer and all who work here. You have asked me to address you this week on topics of urgent importance in our public life as well as in our church life, and I am honored to do so. We live in confusing times, and the question of what Christian witness ought to look like in our day is not easy. So it's all the more important that we try to think wisely and Christianly about these questions. Otherwise, we will simply retreat into a private world and fail in our responsibilities to our own generation. Now, I think our culture is at least two moves away from being able to think easily about, my title tonight, the Bible's challenge to today's world. Two generations ago, most people in my culture, and I suspect yours, uh, at least knew more or less what the Bible was about. That is, they knew the stories, with the story of Jesus in particular at the middle of them. But it was commonly imagined that those stories concerned a religious world, a separate world, rather than the public world where we all lived. 
People have regularly quoted the saying of Jesus about rendering to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and rendering to God the things that are God's, as though that meant a total separation of realms and powers, with Jesus and his message being, as people say, purely spiritual, and issues of human government and law and economics and politics being a different kind of thing for which the Bible would be largely irrelevant. So that was already one remove from being relevant. But then in the current generation, even that basis of distant knowledge has disappeared. Most of my contemporaries in the UK have stopped going to church if they ever did so in the first place. Their children, the age of my children, mostly gave it no thought whatever Religious education in most schools has been a low priority. And most young people in the Western world, and I think many, most parts of the world, have little idea what Christianity is, let alone what it might be or should be. So we are starting a long way back. Now you might say, well, that's fine. That puts us on a level with the early church. In the second century AD, Nobody in the world of Greece or Rome had been expecting anything like the Jesus movement. When those Jesus followers appeared in a town or a city, people didn't say, oh well, here's a new religion. They had plenty of religions with temples and priests and sacrifices and processions and so on. Early Christianity wasn't a bit like that. The early Jesus followers looked to the public gaze like an odd combination of a multi-ethnic synagogue on the one hand, sounds like a contradiction in terms and that's how people saw it, and some sort of a philosophical club talking about who God was and how you should behave. There were no other movements like that. And they not only talked about this man Jesus, but they did lots of Jesus-like things. And by the end of the second century, the authorities had begun to realize this might be dangerous because the church was offering, by what it was as well as what it said, a challenge to the power structures and the economic structures of ordinary life. And they were doing so because they were following Jesus and thereby telling and retelling the story of the Bible. And that's where we meet this evening's title. Now, of course, this evening's title is a shorthand. This rather splendid phrase, the Bible's challenge to today's world, and then the sub-question, how does the Bible speak truth to power and money today? These questions have telescoped together various different things, and we need to expand them back again to see what's going on. For a start, when we're talking about the Bible's challenge to the world, that's really a shorthand for God's challenge to the world through the Bible. As long as the Bible stays on the shelf unopened, it won't be challenging anyone. But God is the creator of all things and all people. And God calls all people to know him and honor him and follow him. And the God we know in Jesus of Nazareth Israel's Messiah, now exalted as Lord, this God reveals himself precisely in and through the story of Jesus, which has its roots deep and firm in Israel's scriptures, and its fruits starting to be apparent in the early Christian writings, thus forming the book we Christians call the Bible, Old and New Testaments, together. So part of the point of talking about the authority of scripture or the challenge of the Bible or of the Bible speaking to anyone at all today is that the God of the Bible is the God who calls human beings to grow up in understanding, to exercise their human responsibilities by grasping or being grasped by the great story of creation and covenant which comes to fruition in Jesus and which then opens out to include the whole world in the story of new covenant and new creation. So when we speak of the Bible's challenge to the world, we're really speaking of 
God's challenge to the world and the Bible's place in shaping and directing that challenge. But then second, the fact that this challenge comes to us, as it were, Bible-shaped, is itself a sign of the way that this true God delights to work in his world. It's not just the content of the Bible which speaks of a different kind of power. It's the fact that God himself works through this story. The story of a small and vulnerable people, Israel, and then within that, the story of one man who ends up getting crucified. God works through the Bible because this story subverts all other human stories and because the Bible, by being a book, and remember that the early Christians taught people to read precisely so they could understand the Bible. God works through the Bible because the Bible challenges its readers to grow up in their understanding, to think things out, to become more fully human instead of just drifting with the cultural or political tides of the day this way or that. But this is to run ahead of ourselves a bit. So if the Bible challenging the world is first a shorthand for God challenging the world, and then second, if God challenges the world specifically through Jesus and his story, then the third point, which we've telescoped together in our title, is the fact that the challenge will always come through men and women and children who speak it because they are themselves grasped and shaped by the Bible and are living it out in the world. The idea of the Bible's authority and challenge must itself be clothed in flesh and blood. It may be enough for us as Jesus' followers to know what the Bible says and to see ourselves as submitting to it. But even in a culture which might be reasonably friendly to Christianity, it won't do simply to go to the people in power, to the people who make decisions in government or banking or business or whatever, and simply say, the Bible says. They may hear you out courteously. They are unlikely to change their policies just because you have quoted texts at them. Although I quickly add that I would never discount the power of God through Scripture to move and change hearts and minds when it is quoted and applied from within the praying life of a community or the individual witness. But my point is that when we're talking about the Bible's challenge, what we really mean is God's challenge through Jesus himself, shaping through Scripture the life and thought of the Spirit-filled followers of Jesus so that they themselves, you yourselves, dare I say, constitute the Bible-shaped challenge, verbal and communal, to the world. And this means we are all involved. It isn't just for the specialists. It isn't just for the theologians or the bishops or the Bible scholars. This is for all followers of Jesus. So the first large point to put on the table, both for today and for the subsequent lectures this week, is that the Bible challenges all human beings to become wise. This is the message of the book of Proverbs. Wisdom. In the New Testament, we associate the idea of wisdom particularly with Paul's letter to the Colossians and also with the letter of James. These books make explicit a theme which is rooted in the book of Genesis itself right at the beginning. All humans are called to be wise because wisdom in the Bible is the shorthand for understanding and reverencing God the creator and reflecting his life and his love and his purposes into the world. Human life is not random. Learning how to live in the world isn't just, though it sometimes feels like this, a matter of blundering around trying to get it right. No, the so-called wisdom literature, like the book of Proverbs, contrasts the wise person with the fool. And the wise person is the one who is living with the grain of the universe, living out of reverence for God the creator, 
and hence able to navigate the complex challenges that are out there in the creator's world. Now, of course, things don't always work out the way they should because there are dark forces at work in God's world. As the book of Job and some of the Psalms, never mind anything else, bear witness. But the challenge to wisdom remains the overarching biblical theme precisely because there is one true God, the creator, and we humans are made to worship him and to reflect him. Every other specific challenge that needs to be issued to those in power or to those who control financial resources is a subset of this fundamental challenge to wisdom. But the biblical challenge to wisdom comes in a second form as well. You can see these two in the first two Psalms. Whoever edited the book of Psalms did a very clever job in putting these two at the beginning. In the first Psalm, there is a straightforward contrast of the righteous and the wicked, like the wise person and the fool in Proverbs. The one goes this way and the other goes that way and the consequences follow naturally. That is the rule in normal times. But the second psalm indicates that the times are often out of joint. Why do the nations rage, asked the psalmist, and why do the peoples imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers take counsel together against Yahweh and against his anointed. Those words were written coming up to 3,000 years ago, but they are as relevant as tomorrow morning's newspaper. So the psalm names the problem, our problem, the problem of human history, the problem of the 20th century, and now most certainly the problem of the 21st century, namely that those who wield power in the world, those who control the world's resources, are again and again in rebellion against the Creator and against the Creator's wise, ongoing purposes for the world. They are using power and money for their own, often wicked purposes. So what is to be done? That second Psalm, Psalm 2, was a favorite among the early Christians, and there's good reason for that. It does what this evening's title says, namely, it confronts the rulers and the power brokers of the world with a word from God himself. Here are the powerful people getting themselves into a tangle with one another and ranting against God in the process. That pretty well sums up the history of our planet for many centuries, never mind the time of Jesus. And then God responds. And God says to them, okay, I've sorted it. I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. I've established my king there. And in the original context, this referred to King David and Solomon and their successors because in the strange purposes of God, the establishment of Israel's monarchy seems to have been designed to bring justice and peace to a warring and confused world, to bring God's order into a world of chaos. Think about it. That's what the original call of Genesis 1.26 was designed to do, to get the human beings to work in the wilderness and make it a garden. That's why the king's vocation is one particular focal point of the general human vocation. So back to the psalm, then the king himself speaks and says, I'll tell you what Yahweh has decreed. He said to me, you are my son, this day have I begotten you. Ask of me and I will give you the nations as your inheritance, the uttermost parts of the world for your possession. And that sequence is very like what we find in Genesis 11 and 12, which are themselves part of the deep roots of the Bible's challenge to the world of power and resources. Because after the building of the Tower of Babel, God then calls Abraham a childless nomad, and he promises him that he will have a family and a land through which the whole world will be blessed. That combination of Genesis 1 and 2, the overall human vocation to make a garden out of a wilderness, 
and Genesis 11 and 12, God's new creation as the answer to human arrogance, all that is foundational for the later biblical challenge to power and money. So Psalm 2 closes with the fundamental challenge, now therefore you kings be wise. I love the idea of, of the Levites in the temple singing away month by month, going through the Psalms and constantly saying, now therefore you kings be wise. Be warned, you judges of the earth. The power, who, who was listening? Who knows? But this was the message. The powerful ones are summoned to give allegiance to God's anointed king, to David and his descendants, and no doubt for many generations in Israel, more or less all the time after Solomon, when things started to go badly wrong, this will have sounded puzzling. They'll have sung these psalms in the temple, knowing perfectly well that the rulers of Egypt and Syria and Mesopotamia and further afield had no intention, so it seemed, of giving any allegiance to Israel's king, even when there was one, which after the exile there wasn't until the shaky and illegitimate regimes of the Hasmoneans and Herodians in the last couple of centuries before Jesus' day. So what was going on? When the early church began to figure out what following Jesus would mean in practice, it was to this promise and warning that they looked back. You can see this in the fourth chapter of the Acts of the Apostles. At the first signs of persecution from the authorities in Jerusalem, they quote Psalm 2 in prayer and they declare that it's all now coming true. The warring nations of the world were symbolized by Herod and Pilate who got together to put Jesus of Nazareth on the cross and God raised him from the dead, thereby declaring that he, Jesus, was the true Lord and that they, Herod and Pilate, were radically out of line. And at the point where the psalm says, now therefore, O kings, be wise and be warned, you rulers of the earth, and give allegiance to God's anointed son. The praying church in Acts 4 declares, now therefore, they use the same phrase, grant to your servants to speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed in the name of your holy child, Jesus. See what's happened? The prayerful, powerful witness of the church in word and in deed constitutes the fresh challenge, the biblically rooted challenge to the powers of the world, declaring that Jesus is Lord and summoning the world to fall into line. Thus, the biblical theology of wisdom, the call of the creator to worship him and so to discover how the world is really supposed to work includes within itself the call to recognize what time it is and what the living God has done and is doing in his world. And with Christian hindsight, this translates into the summons of the gospel itself, the call to follow Jesus. And that's how it's seen again and again in the gospels and by Paul and in the other early Christian writings. But at this point, we run into a problem which has to be named explicitly and explored carefully. Because, as I said at the beginning, in the modern world, it is widely assumed that the call to follow Jesus belongs in a different universe, a religious world to which the people who run the real world need pay no attention. So did the psalmist get it wrong? Did the early church get it wrong? Was this challenge to the ancient world whistling in the dark? Or did it become out of date? Or what? Now the basic point about the Bible's wisdom teaching, as in the book of Proverbs, is, as I've said, that it's designed to show image-bearing human beings what it means to live wisely within the world of creation. Creation and humans are, so to speak, made for one another. We're not an accident crawling around thinking that the world can't possibly be a home. There should be a natural fit 
But because of the power of evil, evil in individuals, evil in institutions, evil not least when evil people get to run evil institutions, the creator must do and has promised to do something radically new. The creator promised, it's there throughout the Old Testament, to act dramatically to break the power of evil and thereby to launch new creation upon the world. A new creation which would confusingly at times overlap with the present creation, breaking in upon the world with a new kind of life and power. And the point of this new creation is that it is precisely new creation. It's not a separate world forgetting the old world. It reaffirms the goodness and the God-givenness of the original creation and thereby reaffirms the importance, the vital importance of living wisely, especially for those who are called to particular responsibilities, called to handle power or money. But the point of the new creation, which the early Christians believed had been launched when Jesus of Nazareth overcame the power of evil on the cross and rose again on the third day, the point was that now a whole new possibility emerged. A world in which heaven and earth would come together. A world in which God's promised future would arrive in the present ahead of its final appearing. A world in which healing and hope, forgiveness and new starts were not just a distant dream, but a present reality. And that is the world in which the early church and we as their descendants are called to voice and to live the Bible's challenge to today's world, particularly in the areas of power and money in many other areas too, of course, but these ones are always high on the list. Where we've gone wrong down the years, I believe, and I'll be saying more about this in each lecture, it seems to come as a recurring theme, is in trying to combine the message of the Bible with the teaching of Plato. Now Plato, the great fourth century BC disciple of the even greater Socrates, was one of the finest philosophers ever to think through the great questions of the world. But at its heart, his philosophy was dualistic. The present world of space and time and matter may be a fine place, not without some signals of ultimate truth, but for Plato, it's essentially secondary, a world of shadows rather than of ultimate reality. So there is a different world, a spiritual world, a heavenly world, if you like, and one day, says Plato, our souls may even find their way back there. Now, I shall be talking later this week about how misleading that is as a way into understanding the Christian hope, though there is a lot of muddle about that among Christians around the world today, because our hope is not a hope for a disembodied heaven, but for the new creation, the new heavens and the new earth, which fulfill Jesus' intention and prayer that God's kingdom would come on earth as in heaven, as we pray day by day in the Lord's Prayer. And in the second and third centuries, it was precisely because they were living out this hope that the early church was persecuted by the Roman Empire. The people who went with Plato, who believed in a super spirituality in which the present world became irrelevant so that the only thing that mattered was a secret inner life and a non-physical immortality after death. They were called the Gnostics. I'll say more about them on Wednesday, God willing. The great teachers of our church rejected them. The Gnostics were not persecuted because they posed no threat to Rome they pose no challenge to the world of power or money or anything else. They had nothing to say to those worlds except that they weren't bothered, weren't interested. And here's our problem. Many modern Western Christians have assumed that something like Gnosticism is the truth without realizing the extent to which it is a corruption of the early church's teaching of creation and new creation of wisdom and renewed wisdom, 
of the good news that Jesus has defeated death itself and has launched God's new world in the resurrection. Again, I shall be saying more about all this later in the week, but for the moment I want to invite you to consider the book of Acts. It's all about power. It says so up front. Jesus says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. That is Jesus' answer to the disciples' puzzled question as to whether this might be the time when Jesus would, quote, restore the kingdom to Israel, unquote. They were still thinking in terms of the first creation in which the people of Israel were called to bear witness to the creator God and they were living on God's promise via Abraham and David for some kind of Psalm 2-like sovereignty over the world. But Jesus was promising a new creation, a transcending of the old creation in which the boundaries were broken and a new power, a new kind of power was on offer, a transformative power which doesn't work the way the world's normal power works. And as you look through Acts, you can see what that means. A movement which starts with a handful of surprised and puzzled people in Jerusalem turns within a generation into a movement which has kings and governors scratching their heads and wondering what's going on and what they should do about it. And the book ends, the book of Acts ends with Paul in Rome. And here is the paradox all through. On the one hand, he's under house arrest, but on the other hand, he is announcing that God is king and that Jesus is Lord openly and unhindered, says Luke. So there's the challenge. God is king and Jesus is Lord right under the nose of Caesar, the biggest power broker in the world, the one who thinks that he is Lord and emperor. And the way Luke has written Acts, he's woven quotations in here and there, echoing those great Old Testament promises about kings shutting their mouths and being astonished because of the servant of the Lord, because of the new thing that God would do. So when the disciples say to Jesus, is this the time for it all to happen, for the kingdom to be restored to Israel, it's pretty clear that Jesus' answer is yes, but not in the way that you think. This is what it means, he's saying, to establish God's sovereign rule in the world through you going off, trusting in the power of the Spirit, ready to suffer and die, to be shipwrecked and imprisoned, whatever it may be, as Jesus himself did, but to establish new communities, a new way of being community in and amongst the communities of the wider world. That was, of course, exactly in line with the challenge to power and money which Jesus himself had issued in the Sermon on the Mount. When we read the Beatitudes at the start of the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are the meek, blessed are the merciful, etc., we are inclined to think of them. I must have heard those being read dozens and dozens of times growing up always inclined to think of them as a list of rather difficult virtues towards which one should aspire. We read that passage often on All Saints Day, and that makes it feel rather remote, as though, well, maybe the great saints had lives like that, but it seems a bit different for me. We've got a long way to go to be pure in heart or meek or hungry for justice or merciful and so on. That way of looking at the Beatitudes may be important as far as it goes, but that is only the reflex of what Jesus is really saying. Jesus is announcing that this is how God is becoming king. That this is the biblical challenge to the world of his day and also the world of our day. Again and again in our popular culture, the sneering so-called new atheists and their followers look at the church and say, well, if Jesus was such a good thing, You've had 2,000 years. How come the world is still in a mess? Nothing has changed. If there really is a God like you say, why doesn't he step in and do something and stop the mess and muddle that the world seems to be in? Which reminds me, 
of the mocking of Jesus on Good Friday. If you really are the Son of God, what are you doing on that cross? This modern mockery came to a head in the 18th century when many people thought of God as the supreme watchmaker or perhaps the manager of the great factory called the world and then they criticized him because the watch didn't seem to be keeping very good time or the factory wasn't turning out the goods that it said on the label. But those were always caricatures resulting from people not paying attention to what Jesus was saying. People often speak today as though if God really was God, if he really did care about the world's sorrows and heartaches, God would send in the tanks and sort out the wickedness and establish the world the way it should be. And Jesus' answer to that in the Sermon on the Mount and his agenda for us as we think about the Bible's challenge to power and money today is that when God wants to solve the world's problems, he doesn't send in the tanks. He sends in the meek and the poor in spirit and the merciful and the peacemakers and the pure in heart and the hungry for justice people. And by the time that Herod and Pilate and Caesar and all the rest of them have woken up and realized something's going on, the meek and the merciful have built hospitals and schools. They are looking after the poor and they are doing and demonstrating the kingdom of God on earth as in heaven. My friends, that is our heritage. The early Christians did it from very early on. The first Jesus followers established those strange, unheard of communities. As I said before, no one else was doing this kind of stuff. They established what you might call egalitarian, worship-based, outward-facing, mutually supportive, fictive kinship groups. That's quite a mouthful, so we call them churches for short. <laughs> Nobody had ever tried that kind of thing before. Of course there were problems. You try any social experiment like that, it's going to be difficult. Things are going to go wrong. That's why half the New Testament got written, to address the difficulties in establishing that kind of new way of living. But the experiment continued. And at its best, and there's more of the best than you might imagine, that is what the church still is today. And that's actually how and why Christianity spread in the first three centuries, at the time when the Romans and others were doing their best to stamp it out. This was a new and powerfully attractive way of being human, previously unimagined. It appealed particularly to the various underclasses, like slaves and women, who were suddenly given new dignity and responsibility. That already spoke volumes about power and money, since slaves and women were in the ancient pagan world more or less property under the power of some man or other. And the Jesus followers were modeling and explaining as they went along what it meant that the creator of the world had launched his new creation and that they as individuals and more especially they as communities were the pilot project for this new world. God had put them right with him so that they could be putting right people for the world. Justification and justice. Let me say that sentence again. God had put them right with him so that they could be putting right people for the world. God had called them to live with a new kind of power so that they could be people of that power for the healing of the world. God had called them to use their resources in a new way so that they could show the world what it meant that the world's creator is the God of generous, lavish love. That's how it all began. A good deal of this comes to a particular focal point in the 10th chapter of St. Mark's Gospel. Again, I want to stress the way in which this challenge to today's world is designed to function. It is a matter of the living God speaking through scripture to explain and highlight the significance of Jesus' kingdom bringing work, enabling communities and individuals to live in Jesus' new world and to explain it 
so that the powerful and rich in the world are confronted with a reality they hadn't expected. In the middle of Mark chapter 10, we find a rich young man running up to Jesus to ask him what he ought to do to be sure of attaining the age to come. We need to pause a moment and remind ourselves, again I'll come back to this later this week, that in most translations it says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? But that doesn't mean the platonic dream of escaping this world and going to a disembodied heaven. It means the first century Jewish aspiration of the age to come, which would transform the present evil age. So this young man comes up and says, so the age to come is obviously what you're all about. You're talking about the kingdom of God coming now. So what must I do to be sure I'm going to be part of that? Now, Plenty of people who came to see Jesus got all sorts of instructions and often that didn't involve money, but in this case, Jesus could see right through to where this man's heart really was. And his money was the idol that was stopping him worshiping God, his creator. So the young man rattles off half the Ten Commandments. Yeah, murder, theft, adultery, that's fine. Got all those sorted. But Jesus puts his finger on an earlier one. You shall have no other gods before me. Give it all up, he says. Come and follow me. Jesus actually did say that word to a lot of other people, and he's gone on saying it, including people like St. Francis, but many other lesser-known followers. With other people, it will be something else. But the point here is that money is a servant, not a master. And that when we become its servant, we give it a life of its own. This is what happens with all idolatries. A new and ugly and quite literally soul-destroying life. And when you get a whole community of rich young rulers whose whole lives are dominated by that passion for money, you are looking at a deeply dysfunctional and sick society. But after the young man has gone away sorrowful, unwilling to abandon his many possessions and follow Jesus, pretty soon Jesus' own disciples, who've been patting themselves on the back because they did leave everything to follow him, they turn out to be making a very similar mistake in a different area. You know how it goes. James and John, brothers, they come and ask Jesus if they can have the best seats in the kingdom. They're assuming that when they get to Jerusalem, Jesus is going to take over and establish some kind of theocratic rule, but a basically ordinary kingdom with Jesus sitting in the middle like David or Solomon, and he's going to need somebody at his right and somebody at his left, a home secretary and a foreign secretary or whatever it's going to be. That was a natural mistake to make, but it was a mistake nonetheless. Actually, I think James and John were doing a sort of preemptive strike because there was another pair of brothers around, namely Simon Peter and Andrew, and I think they were getting in first. Jesus tells them that it's time to move from the first creation, which had been taken over by the contradictions and darkness of evil, into the new creation where everything looks different and where power itself works the other way up. Jesus says, listen, the rulers of the Gentiles, they do power in the normal way. They boss and bully people around. They get their way by violence and threats. We're going to do it the other way. It's not going to be like that with us. And then he explains looking ahead as James and John had resolutely not been looking ahead to what he had already been telling them was the way in which the kingdom would in fact make its way and be accomplished. We're going to do it the other way because, he says, the Son of Man didn't come to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. You see what's going on? And you see how we in modern Western Christianity have split apart what Mark and behind him Jesus himself had firmly held together. We have regularly taken that final phrase, the Son of Man giving his life as a ransom for many, and we have called that atonement theology. It's about Christ dying for our sins so that dot, 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 
So that what? So that we could go to heaven and forget this world? Jesus doesn't say that. It's about the Messiah dying for our sins in accordance with the scriptures so that we could become part of his new creation. So that when God makes his whole world over anew, when God is all in all, we will be raised from the dead to share in that new world. And in that new world, which Jesus was launching then and there, there is a new kind of power. The old power can do quite a lot, but it succeeds by the ultimate threat of killing those who get in the way. The new power gives its life so that people may be raised from the dead. In Mark 10, we find the meaning of the cross then inside a new vision of power. Or if you like, we find a redefinition of power itself focused dramatically on the power of Jesus' cross, which as we know from the whole New Testament is the power of love, the love by which the Creator made the world in the first place, the love which sent Jesus to die, the love which sends the Holy Spirit to renew people, to reassemble God's people, to send out God's people to instantiate his kingdom already in the present time in all the world. And when we pull back the camera lens and look at Mark chapter 10 as a whole, which we haven't got time to do tonight, then we see as Jesus goes to Jerusalem a whole panoply of redefined creation from family life, marriage and children, through money and power and self-sacrifice and much besides. Passages like this, and there are many of them in Scripture, are the very lifeblood of the Bible's challenge to today's world. Because time is short, I give you two others so that if you want to follow these things up, read more about it, take notes and go, and go back home and look these up, you could do that. But these in context are all about the power of new creation and the ways in which that confronts our present world. The first is in Paul's letter to the Colossians. Remind ourselves, Paul is in prison when he's writing this letter. He knows all about the dark powers of the world that sometimes came at him full on and sometimes sneaked up behind through the cunning of a false co-worker or the lies of a local magistrate or the irrational anger of a whipped up mob. So Paul was no dreamer imagining that the world was a delightful place now that Jesus was Lord. Far from it. Paul knew otherwise. But Paul can say, Colossians chapter 1, one of the greatest early Christian poems, that all things in heaven and on earth, all principalities and rulers and powers, were created in and through and for the Messiah, Jesus himself. He was the one through whom the worlds were made for whom the worlds were made, including their power structures. And then in the second half of the poem, Colossians 1, 18 to 20, Paul declares that all things, including, again, all power structures, have been reconciled to God, again, through and for the Messiah, through and for Jesus, by means of his death on the cross. Paul doesn't say in this poem what happened to those good created powers in order for them to need reconciling. He says very briefly in the next chapter that they were defeated when Jesus died on the cross. As often with Paul, we want him to fill in the gaps, but he doesn't. He's in a hurry. But the point for our purposes ought to be clear. The new creation is not the abandonment of the old one, but its restoration to proper functioning once the dark power of rebellion and death has been overcome. And the whole of Colossians, not least the bracing ethical instructions in chapter 3, are to be seen not just as a code of ethics, as a general set of rules for life, but as the powerful way of life through which the new creation is exemplified before the surprised world. The way of life, which is the way of life of Jesus' followers, and which embodies and articulates the Bible's challenge to today's world.
The other passage to which I draw your attention, and again you could study this for hours, is John chapters 18 and 19, focused on the extraordinary exchange between Jesus and Pontius Pilate. This conversation is the heart of Johannine irony. Jesus retains the initiative throughout, even though Pilate is about to have him killed. And Jesus puts Pilate on the spot on the issues of kingdom and truth and, yes, power, until Pilate doesn't know what to say. Pilate, of course, as the chief priests are quick to remind him, represents Caesar himself, the king of the world. Jesus represents the kingdom of God. Jesus interprets that kingdom in terms of his mission to tell the truth, which makes Pilate snort and sneer and say, well, what is truth? Pilate knows well enough that despite Rome's great boast to bring justice to the world, empires, in fact, make their own truth as they go along. But Jesus has come to speak truth to power, and there he is doing it, to tell and to live the truth of new creation, the new creation which will come into being when death itself is defeated, a victory in which Pilate will play his unwitting role, labeling Jesus in public as king of the Jews. In other words, the Psalm 2 man, the true son of God, the true son of David, the one who will hold the nations to account and warn their rulers to behave themselves. Until we learn to read John like this, we're not really getting to grips with the Bible's challenge to the world. And so Jesus rebukes Pilate at one point. Pilate says, don't you know that I have the power, there it is, to, to crucify you or deliver you? And Jesus says, you couldn't have any power over me unless it were given you from above. So the one who delivered me to you has the greater sin. There's the point. If even Jesus acknowledges that even Pontius Pilate has a God-given authority over him, then we see that the created order really is good and that the creator really does want human beings to exercise responsibility within it. But they will be held to account for what they do with their God-given power. And the power that will hold them to account is precisely the power of new creation, the victory which will be won in Jesus' death and the new world which will be launched in his resurrection. This is the victory which overcomes the world, declares John in his first letter, even our faith. So there's much more we could say about power from Colossians and John and elsewhere, not least the book of Revelation, incidentally, but I trust that the point has been made. And as I move towards my conclusion, it's time briefly to consider more specifically what this might mean in our own dangerous and disturbing world today. I've been emphasizing that the story we find in Scripture, the great story which focuses on Jesus himself and climaxes in his death and resurrection, his ascension and the sending of the Spirit, the story which is rooted deep in Israel's Scriptures and explained in the writings of the early church, this story is given to the followers of Jesus to be our marching orders. The Bible speaks truth to power by enabling us to live and speak the new way of power. We are to speak the truth to the God mammon by living in a new relationship to all our resources, money included. The church grasped this from the beginning. When Paul met Peter and James and John in Jerusalem, recorded in Galatians chapter 2, the one thing they insisted on, according to Paul in Galatians, was that Paul should, quote, go on remembering the poor. Unquote. The inside out view of money, that we have money in order to give it away to those who need it, was central to the church's existence from the start. And Paul himself modeled with pain and difficulty the new way of power, never more so than in the crisis which precipitated the writing of 2 Corinthians, where he declared, When I am weak, then I am strong. That was the point. He was living out the message and the meaning of the cross, not only before the church, but before the watching world. 
Now, we need hardly add that the church has not always been good at getting power and money sorted out in its own life, still less in bearing witness before the world. But part of our problem today is that our media embodying the sneering prejudices of secularism, I confess I haven't been reading your local newspapers here, so I have no idea if they would do this too, but they certainly do in the UK. The media embodying the sneering prejudices of secularism is ready to pounce on anything which the church does wrong. And there's always been plenty of that, but the media never wants to publicize all the things we do right. One of the joys of being a bishop when I was working in Durham in the UK is that I saw the church being the church in so many, many local situations which never made it into the papers but certainly made it into the hearts and lives of real ordinary communities and into the consciousness of many in local government. I witnessed situations where local authorities had been trying to sort out some situation of whether it was a drug addiction in one particular poor community or a really bad and difficult school which they didn't seem to be able to change. But the church was able, through humble and self-giving service in some of the toughest parts of the northeast of England, to transform a school here, a hospice there, a rehab center, a prison visiting facility, and so on. A few years ago, someone drew up statistics in the UK about who was volunteering to do all the things which governments can't do, but which help to make a community function. And again and again, it was people in the churches who stood out, not all by themselves, of course, but regularly taking the lead. We have more and more food banks in the UK today than we ever had. Most of them are run by churches. And the thing I really like about that is that these tend not to be folk who have studied political theology and are then saying, okay, I've worked out the theory, now let's go and put it into practice. They're simply ordinary praying Christians who spot a local need and get together and do something about it. And it's out of that local concern that there grow larger national initiatives. The Archbishop of Canterbury, coming himself from a business background, has launched initiatives to prevent the big loan sharks from fleecing the poorest of the poor. And globally, the Jubilee 2000 project 20 years ago brought together churches of all sorts to protest to the British government against the unpayable compound interest that was being charged on loans to third world countries. There's a long way still to go on that one, but considerable debt remission did take place with lasting transformative effects for the countries concerned. Of course, the hypocrisy of the system emerged in 2008 and 9, when at the height of the financial crash, the big banks came cap in hand to ask for their debts to be remitted. And the very rich did for the very rich what they had persistently refused to do for the very poor. Now, all this needs working through, thinking through, praying through. I'm not saying it's easy. But I am saying that with the gospel of Jesus, a new way of being human has been launched and that this challenges the ordinary ways that the world does power and money and much besides. And I am saying that the church centrally in its mission must model and articulate this biblical challenge before the world. To say it again, the church often gets it badly wrong in these and other areas of life. There is a reason why we say, forgive us our trespasses every day in the Lord's Prayer. But that, of course, goes with the prayer that God's kingdom will come and his will be done on earth as in heaven, not somewhere else. And the church that prays that prayer and that learns to live by that prayer will be the church whose very existence calls the world to account. That's, after all, what Jesus promised in John chapter 16, that when the Spirit comes, the Spirit will call the world to account because of sin and righteousness and judgment. How will the Spirit do that? Precisely through the life and the explanatory teaching of Jesus' followers.
That will mean Christians being trained carefully and deeply in the finer points of power and money. There's no point people like me, a theologian rather than an economist, pretending to understand all the small print. But without the vision from scripture, we won't even get to the large print, let alone the small stuff. We need the vision, the new creational vision of a different way to be human, a different way of power, a different way of resources. That's what the church at its best has always held before the world. That, please God, is the challenge of the Bible to the world today. The speaking of truth to power and money and every other idol that gets in the way of the healing purposes of our loving God. So may God be with us and give us courage and strength to be faithful to this mission and message in the days to come. Thank you very much.